Hi everyone, Mike here from Bikes by Mike with another cycling related video. Today I'm going to share with you what I've learned about continuous glucose monitors, or CGMs for short, and my own personal experience with them. I was supposed to only try it once, but then something weird happened, so I tried it again. It'll take a bit of explaining. Okay, let's get to it. In today's video, I'll start with an intro on glucose. What is it? Why do we need it? And where is it stored in our bodies? I'll then briefly explain what continuous glucose monitors are and how they work. I'll talk about the latest hype with CGMs. I'll share my understanding of what the science has to say about CGMs and try to summarize the pros and cons with using this type of device. I'll show you the basics of setting up and using the Freestyle Libra 2 and share my experience using this sensor. Finally, I'll wrap things up with my final thoughts on the Libra 2 and CGMs in general. I know this is a long one, so feel free to jump through the video using the timestamps if you don't want to watch the whole thing. But this video took forever to put together, so I'm hoping you watch everything. First things first, I'm not a coach, trainer, physician, or sports scientist. I'm just a cyclist that's done my own research on these devices, wanting to share what I know with you. If you're looking at CGMs to address a specific health issue like diabetes, you really should consult your healthcare provider. Before I talk about CGMs, it's important to cover off the basics of glucose. What is it? Why do athletes need it? And where is it stored? As for what it is, glucose is a monosaccharide or simple sugar. Glucose can appear naturally in foods like what is found in honey and fruit or in the form of added sugar when it's added during the manufacturing process. Glucose can also be linked together in chains called starches. Starches are complex carbs found in abundance in such foods as corn, potato, rice, and wheat. So why is glucose important? It's important because it's the body's main source of energy, with our brain requiring a constant supply to stay alive and well. For endurance athletes like cyclists, a constant supply of glucose is necessary to optimize performance, especially for higher intensity efforts where your body recruits most of its energy from glucose and glycogen stores. The rate of fat versus carb oxidation can best be understood by looking at this chart that shows the intensity of exercise on the x-axis measured as a percentage of maximal oxygen uptake, or VO2 max, and the percentage of energy your body extracts from fat versus carbs on the y-axis. You can see that fat's oxidation is highest with the lowest intensity exercise. Although even when working out at low percentage of VO2 max, you're still getting a small amount of your energy needs from carbs. But then as you increase exercise intensity, you get to a point around 60 to 65% of VO2 max, where your body derives most of its energy from carbs. And then at super high intensity efforts, it's getting almost all its energy from carbs. But these percentages can vary significantly among individuals based on their health and level of fitness. Finally, where is glucose stored? There are two main locations where glycogen, the stored form of glucose is stored, the liver and muscle tissue. Approximately 8 grams is stored in the liver and 400 grams in skeletal muscle tissue, but this varies among individuals. Only about 4 grams is stored as blood glucose. So in total, we have roughly 600 grams of glucose and glycogen in our bodies. But the amount of stored glycogen available for use is much less than this. For example, when muscle glycogen drops by more than 50% of initial values, muscle function is severely impaired, so continuing to exercise without first topping up on muscle glycogen stores becomes near impossible. Anyone who doesn't consume carbohydrates during intense exercise will deplete their glycogen stores to the point that impairs performance within 60 to 90 minutes. So those of you that like to brag about how little you eat or drink while riding, stop doing it, really. A continuous glucose monitor, or CGM, is a device that automatically measures your blood glucose level, also called blood sugar, throughout the day and night. In that way, it can be used to spot trends in glucose levels and assist in identifying the cause of changes in blood sugar. Regardless of the brand, CGMs essentially work all the same way. An applicator is used to apply a biosensor to your upper arm. The applicator has a needle that penetrates the skin, opening up a hole to insert a very thin filament. The needle retracts back into the applicator, leaving the filament and the disc-shaped base in place. The base houses the circuitry, battery, Bluetooth chip, and memory chip. 
Once in place, the sensor stays in place for two weeks, after which it no longer will work and needs to be removed from the skin. The sensor takes regular periodic blood glucose readings and transmits this information in real time to your smartphone or some other device. While prices vary among brands, generally you pay about $90 Canadian for a two-week sensor. I first took note of continuous glucose monitors when the company Super Sapiens released its version of a CGM to endurance athletes back in 2021. For the next couple of years, there's quite a bit of hype that CGMs would well be the next best thing in bringing performance improvements to endurance athletes, including cyclists. Lots of people plugged its benefits, like Chris Froome, who knows a thing or two about elite cycling. Froome sees the future of CGMs being as impactful to the sport as when power meters were first introduced. Wow, that's a bold prediction although he's not exactly impartial or neutral when it comes to this product. Even though Super Sapiens made a splash when it came to market, the technology used really wasn't all that new. CGMs are a medical device that has been around for years. Two of the biggest brands are Freestyle Libra and Dexcom. Both offer similar products and both almost exclusively market their products for use by diabetics who need constant regulation of their blood glucose levels. Actually, the biosensor patch used by Super Sapiens was actually produced by Abbott, the pharmaceutical company behind the Freestyle Libra CGM. Super Sapiens abruptly closed down its operations earlier this year, citing strategic restructuring as the reason. Rumors at the time was that their inability to get their product approved for sale in the U.S. and Canada was a factor, as was the UCI banning CGM use in competition. That UCI prohibition still stands today. These underlying factors that led to the company shutting down its operations were recently confirmed by the company's CEO. Plans are in the works to relaunch Super Sapiens with new investors and a new business strategy. Now we need to talk about the somewhat controversial issue of the efficacy of CGMs. First things first, it's undisputed that CGMs offer huge health benefits for those suffering with diabetes. It is essential for diabetics to keep their blood sugar levels within a normal range, as deviating outside this range can cause serious short and long-term health consequences. As a CGM provides continuous monitoring of blood glucose, it can provide early warning notice to a diabetic of the need to take corrective action to get their blood sugar level back into a safe zone. So nobody questions that these devices work or that these devices are beneficial to diabetics. However, the newer trend, as I've mentioned, is the marketing of these devices to healthy, non-diabetic people. Or in the case of Super Sapiens, encouraging seriously fit and highly trained athletes to use their device. And it is here that the evidence in favor of the use of CGMs to improve performance and overall health in non-diabetics is not as convincing. But let's start with the good reasons a normal healthy person may want to try a CGM. The first reason is detecting prediabetes. This is something that doctors often screen for as part of routine blood work in an annual physical exam. It has two parts. A test for fasting glucose, which is your blood glucose reading after 8 to 12 hours of fasting. And the second is a hemoglobin A1C test, which reflects your average blood glucose level over the past two to three months. It is measured as a percentage of the hemoglobin proteins in your blood that are coated with sugar. Normal fasting glucose is between 3.9 and 5.6 millimoles per liter, or 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. A normal range for A1C is below 5.7%. A CGM allows you to measure your fasting blood glucose yourself. And while it does not actually measure A1C, some of the devices like the Freestyle Libra 2 I was using will provide an A1C estimate. The second potential benefit is measuring glucose variability. Some CGM makers suggest that monitoring your blood glucose is important to keep levels within an ideal range to optimize both health and physical performance. You can affect glucose levels by choosing when and what to eat, for example. More on this a bit later. The third and final potential benefit, if you can call it that, is curiosity. This is the main reason I decided to give it a go. I just wanted to see for myself how my blood sugar level changed throughout the day. And having experienced the dreaded exercise bonk, 
I was curious to know what my blood sugar reading was at the first onset of feeling a bonk coming on. Spoiler, it was below 4.0 millimoles per liter. Now for two reasons you may not want to use a CGM. Yeah, I'm only going to mention two, but they are kind of big. The first is that there is no conclusive evidence yet that using CGMs in non-diabetics leads to long-term health benefits, disease prevention, or performance enhancement. More research is needed, but anyone touting its use is overstating benefits. And for athletes looking to gain a performance edge, like a lot of us, there is no research to suggest that the data collected from CGMs can direct nutrition and fueling strategies to improve performance. So basically, even if the CGM is accurately measuring what is designed to measure, there's no scientific basis demonstrating that this data can be used by an athlete to lay out a better nutrition or carb fueling strategy. And that brings me to my second con with CGMs for non-diabetics. What it's measuring may not be the best indicator of the level of glucose stores or the best predictor of fatigue. Let me bring back my earlier chart that showed where our bodies store glucose and glycogen. The vast majority, 400 grams, is stored in our muscle tissue. About 80 grams is in our liver and only 4 grams in our blood. And of course, CGMs are not measuring our total glycogen reserves, only the 1% of glucose that circulates throughout our blood. So not only are you not measuring what's really important, that being your muscle and liver glycogen levels, but these levels have been shown to drop well before your blood glucose drops and you bonk. Plus, because fatigue is so complex and multifaceted, simply maintaining high blood glucose does not mean a cyclist won't experience fatigue due to other factors. Installing the Libra 2 sensor only takes a few seconds. It's applied to the back of your arm using the included sensor applicator and is held in place by strong adhesive. You need to wait about 60 minutes for the sensor to warm up before glucose readings can be taken. After an hour, you're good to pair the sensor to a glucose-specific reader or to an iOS or Android smartphone app. I've installed the app on my phone. The homepage shows your current glucose reading at the top with an arrow showing you where it's trending. Green means good to go, as does a horizontal line which indicates stable glucose. The line graph at the bottom shows you your last 8-hour trend with a typical normal range of between 3.9 and 10 millimoles per liter highlighted in light green. The main sidebar menu gives you options for several standardized reports and provides more details on your blood glucose trends and patterns. You can view your average daily patterns over the course of one week, two weeks, one month, or three months. There is a time and range bar graph that displays the percentage of time spent with a low, normal, high, or very high blood glucose level. All these reports give you the option to view results over different time periods. You have a report just showing low glucose events with the number of events shown with a red bar. You can also look at your average glucose reading at different times of the day. For most people, this will be their fasting glucose level measured sometime during the middle of the night. There is a daily graph report which shows trends for each day, shown as a line graph. And finally, the Libra 2 will estimate your hemoglobin A1C percentage based on the data it's collected so far. So the app does have some simple and handy features to make it easier to analyze your blood glucose data. So I used two different sensors over two different time periods. The first one I wore from April 25th to May 3rd. The second one was taking readings from May 8th to the 22nd. So the first one I only wore for eight days, while the second one I wore for the maximum life of the unit, which is two weeks. With my first sensor, I was getting fasting glucose scores around 6.5 millimoles per liter, which is pre-diabetes range. I was also getting high spikes in my blood glucose after lunch and dinner. This didn't worry me at first as I chalked it up to a one-off bad day, but then I got equally bad readings on subsequent days. No change. I was getting worried at this point, so I spoke to my family doctor. He was also surprised by my readings as all my prior blood lab tests came back with normal fasting glucose and A1C scores. He suggested I have my blood retested, which I did a couple days later. I was totally relieved when my blood work came back as normal. The blood lab had recorded my fasting glucose as 4.5 millimoles per liter or 81 milligrams per deciliter. 
right within the normal range. But my Libra 2 sensor was giving me a reading of 7.2 millimoles per liter or 130 milligrams per deciliter. At the time, my blood was taken by the lab. So massively different results. My lab results showed my fasting glucose as normal, while my CGM put me in the diabetic category. I don't know what was going on with my sensor, but it was not producing accurate readings. Maybe the sensor was defective or maybe I installed it improperly. But whatever the reason, I took it off after eight days as it wasn't giving me any data I could rely on. Even though my blood work confirmed that I was not a diabetic, I wanted to give the Libra 2 another chance to see if I could get proper blood glucose measurements. This time, it appeared to be doing its job properly. My fasting glucose level was shown in a healthy range, and the spikes were also more moderate and explainable. This was my glucose reading during a pretty intense five-hour ride. It started off stable and normal when the pace was slow, but then you can see several spikes throughout the ride. These spikes were predictable and were likely caused by the higher intensity of the ride, as well as the energy bars and carb drink I was consuming regularly. There was a short period where my sensor lost connection to my phone, and this part in red where my blood sugar dropped below 4 millimoles per liter, which is a pretty good indication I was close to bonking. This second sensor worked without any issues for the two weeks I was wearing it. I guess I can sum up my experience with using continuous glucose monitor as interesting, but not all that useful. At least not for the purpose of optimizing my fueling strategy on and off the bike. And this is not a knock at the Freestyle Libra 2. While the first sensor I used didn't work properly, I do think it was just an odd occurrence. The Libra 2, like many other CGMs, is licensed in Canada in the US for use by diabetic patients. So I know it has to be both accurate and reliable for use by people that absolutely require it to manage their blood sugar levels. If I were a diabetic, I'd be happy using this device. But for me, the main reason I wanted to try it out was to see if it could help me improve my fueling strategy before, during, and after training. And while it was kind of cool to see how my blood sugar levels changed throughout the day and over the course of a ride, I didn't find the data that helpful. And it didn't cause me to change my fueling strategy. Maybe that's because I've already spent quite a bit of time over the years working out the best carb fueling protocol that works for me. Or maybe I just have the same reservations expressed by a lot of nutritionists and sports science researchers that CGMs haven't yet proved their benefit among the non-diabetic population. It's possible that using CGM could increase awareness of your glucose patterns and maybe help you find ways to optimize your energy and metabolic health. But, and this is a big but, this is a double-edged sword because there is such a thing as too much information and the potential for data to be misrepresented, or in my case, wrong data entirely. Not only did I not experience any tangible benefit in using the device, it caused me a lot of stress. There was a period of four or five days where I was seriously contemplating life as a diabetic. If you want to learn more about the pros and cons of using a CGM, Check out this really good podcast where two experts in the field dig deep into the science. So that is pretty much it for my experience using the Freestyle Libra 2 Continuous Glucose Monitor. I wanted so much for this device to boost my performance, but it didn't. Tell me what you think. Are CGMs the cat's meow or just another overhyped performance tool for endurance athletes? That's all I got for today, folks. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you're not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe as allow me to produce more content for all of you. See you next time. Happy rolling.